Welcome everyone to Stogie Geeks number 380 being recorded on May 17th, 2024. I am your host, Paul Asadorian. Very excited to be here in the return of the Stogie Geeks. Mr. Joe Hozempa is to my left. Welcome How's it Joe? Go? How's it going? It's good to be back. Yes, good to have you. Mr. Jim McMurray is with us remotely. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Jim is uh, kind enough to be one of our sponsors. In fact, right now, our only sponsor for Stogie Geeks at ThreatHunter.ai. I thought, um, you know, while we get things rolling here, I'd give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about ThreatHunter.ai, Jim. Oh, wow. Put me on the spot. I don't, I don't even spot. know what to give say. Give me the elevator pitch for your company. <laughs> we do it you need it we do it that's yeah you know what that's that's good and so is it more of like a managed provider managed services provider managed security services provider you can kind of put us in those buckets but we don't do everything what's inside those buckets you know we're we're more like you hired a guy named milton to work 24 hours a day seven mm -hmm. days a week never takes a vacation and we go and hunt and look for bad things in your environment, and we go and mitigate it for you. That's awesome. And you stay busy. You've got crazy stories about yeah. the work that you do. You encounter uh, a lot of interesting people and a lot of interesting scenarios. So, wide range of customers, and and of course, you know, a my age, you know, I've I've seen quite a lot. I haven't seen everything mm. yet, but I've seen quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yes. I was wondering, Jim, actually, because I was listening to a, a podcast and we talked about it in our uh, other show as well. There's a supercomputer for sale. In uh, 2016, the Cheyenne supercomputer was like number 10, fastest right. supercomputer in the world. It was used for uh, climate modeling, weather modeling, and uh, I think a few other kind of uh, modeling activities. And I believe they paid $11 million for it, and it just closed out on auction for like 480000 I feel right. like that's something you would you would buy on auction. You, you, know, <laughs> you know, actually, I actually put a bid in, but it was too low. Mm. <laughs> because part of that is that that price that it went for didn't include dismantling and removal and shipping. Yes. Correct. You know, you add all that in, and you're talking a lot more than that four hundred thousand dollars. They yes, to actually get it back to where it's in a working state in a new location. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I've, you know, it's funny relating that to cigars. I've, I've had a couple of, uh, I guess you could say bids on cigar collections that never went through, you know, someone right. wants to get rid of a bunch of cigars or, uh, has, a, there was someone that had like a bunch of Opus X and it just, it both times it didn't pan out for me. Um, but maybe the opportunity will present itself because I like, I got a humidor to fill. Uh, for our Stogie Geeks fans out there, uh, it's funny, the the giant, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Jim, but there's a giant double door uh, humidor uh, that was in this studio, and then we moved it, uh, no, it's next door, then we moved it in here, then we moved it back, and now we're moving it back in here. <laughs> so it's going to sit just beyond the cameras, really, there's a spot for it, and right now it's completely empty. Oh. So I've got to fill it. I mean, we estimate it'll easily hold 50 boxes of cigars. Uh, one of the production guys was just asking me, he's like, how much do you think it would cost to to fill that humidor? And I'm like, uh, at least like starting is probably two grand, depending on what you put in there. If you go like right. budget, uh, you know, reasonably priced, close out discount cigars, I think you can reasonably fill it for about two grand. And about estimate. $500 worth of asset. Yes. And that would season it very well with a certain flavoring <laughs> certainly so you, you i've been to a couple of estate sales here mm -hmm. for both whiskey and cigars mm. and you know i live pretty close to hollywood at the hollywood hills um and there are a lot of old movie stars that have these collections that go back to the 1930s Wow. Cigars and whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't bought anything yet because I've been too chicken. Uh, and because, you know, honestly, I'm not I'm not an expert when it comes to buying 
old cigars. You know, what should I be mm. looking for? You know, uh, um, how how am I going to find the 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 beetle in the haystack? <laughs> right, so to speak. Right. Um, but some of these things, I went to one three weeks ago, and they had 18,000 18, plus cigars in three lots for sale. 18,000 cigars, did you say? 18,000 cigars. Wow. And a lot of them had no wrappers. And it's like, what am I even buying here? Mm, I, it's a lot I, of work, yeah. And, you don't, and you're not even allowed to touch them, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't want everyone touching those cigars. Mm -hmm. so it's like, well, how do I know I'm getting something that is going to be worthwhile? That's an interesting uh, topic because... <laughs> So much has happened in a year, right? Well, yeah, so. and I this is just so everyone knows, like this episode, my goal was to get the sponsorship out there, threathunter.ai, and then really just have a conversation about like whatever. There's no agenda uh, for this show. I just wanted the first one to be just the three of us catching up, talking about cigars, whiskey, and probably some weird computer stuff as well. I think that's probably the elevator pitch for this show. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Do you want me to tell you a story about my topic? Yeah, please do. Okay, Sorry. cool. No, yeah, no worries. Uh, I've I'm working with a I I moonlight at a couple of cigar shops, uh, putting them online and stuff like that. I just enjoy the the e-commerce sales of it uh, there. And over the past year, I've had the opportunity to be in that same position as you were, Jim. Where you know there are older cigar companies that have closets and vaults full of um a lot of cigars so it's a lot so like a a specific number uh and they were old brands and they never really took off or they were brands that were made and never really took off and there's a whole underground movement to like purchase them from mm -hmm. different and and so you know i was talking to different factories with some different owners and they were talking about that you know the possibility of putting it online to kind of find these lost treasures and stuff like that there are a couple of uh outlets out there in the cigar industry that that do that right where they kind of resurge some some lost and found cigars and stuff like that so um it's very, it's very interesting because you can purchase you know 1800 boxes or whatever and when you actually see them and they take a picture and, and tell you what they want for the price it's exactly how you explained it no labels they can tell you what it used to be mm -hmm. they can give you a sample it, it, like your palate would have to be very defined to identify uh you know what region it's even from and stuff like that you know what i mean and and uh yeah, before I bought 1,800 cigars, I'd want to smoke at least one. Right? Right. <laughs> Make sure that I like it. <laughs> well, well this, this wasn't even at, through an auction house. It literally was an estate sale yeah. published, and it's somebody's house, and the executor of the will, you know, is just, he dumped everything outside the, the house and said, okay, it's all up for sale. Mm. Um, and so they don't know anything about cigars. Or the whiskey that they had. Hmm. Well, Jim, we lost your audio. What? Oh, no, you're no. back. Was it know, a good? Was weird. Was it a good price per stick? <laughs> no, they wanted everything all at once. Yeah, okay, you gotta buy it as a lot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I did wind up buying. I didn't buy any sticks. I did wind up buying some. Uh, very old Buffalo Trace uh, bottles. I did buy um, a Pappy Rye, Family mm -hmm. Reserve Rye, um, from 1997, 98. That was I unopened. They, I didn't know they made Pappy that long ago because it didn't become popular until much later. Right. Maybe ten years later, yeah, it was about when it started. I when I, I think that's when I started hearing about it. it. Was about ten years later. Yeah, and was it, it was a movie star or someone that? Yeah, I, I I never remember. There was supposedly a so, movie, like, like Matthew and, McConaughey or something. Yes, like that. Yeah. was it Matthew McConaughey? That's yes. name pops in my head. Yeah, wonder if he ever got any kickback on that one. I know, right? Because he, I mean. It's amazing in, you know, 
circumstances like that, how one influencer can make something really popular, right? And then multiple influencers and it starts to catch on. We saw that with the Stanley mugs, right? <laughs> um, I'm sure we've seen that in, have we seen that in cigars though, where there's a, an influencer or uh, like celebrity that popularizes a cigar? I want to say Opus X is probably the closest story in my mind because I want to say Michael Jordan and some basketball players were smoking Opus X that led to its popularity. Um, but I don't think that was the only thing that led to its its popularity. Well, go back even further. I think George Burns did. Mm. Cigar smoking in general was popularized by yeah. uh, celebrity figures. I, hey, I but, agree. But David before, Letterman. Before I light this. Oh, yeah. We should talk about what we're smoking, too. Uh -oh. We're not, we're not going to skip that. I promise. Okay. So, Year of the Dragon, right? And this is actually really cool. I can pull it off without ripping it. Now, it's pardon my ignorance is that this year's or last year's this is this year's this year's is year, year of the dragon right so if you look at the end can you see that very well yeah is it um the is there no wrapper on that There's part no wrapper on the end yeah i actually i like that do you know why i like that jim why so when they um leave the foot and leave a little space where there is no wrapper you get to experience the flavors in just the binder and the filler without the, without the wrapper. So you can kind of get a sense for, it's kind of like, um, well, kind of like DevOps, right? We're breaking up the work into smaller parts. So it breaks up my work and my palate into separate parts. Whereas that first, that's not even a first third, right? That first uh, three quarters of an inch or so, I can focus on what are the flavors in the binder and the filler? Like, what should I be picking up? And I try and pay attention to that. And then when the wrapper kicks in, in my brain, I try and pay attention to, well, what changed? What new flavors am I picking up in the yeah. wrapper? And I, I, I like I like that experience uh, in, in, in a cigar because it's different. It's obviously not in every cigar. Um, so I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to find some Year of the Dragon. I think when I, last time I went to one of my local shops, they were sold out. And what are you smoking? I am smoking the Davidoff Anniversario Number no. One, which I really like. I picked up a, oh, a really few of long these. one. Yeah, the really long one. I really did. I dig this cigar. I don't know if I could smoke them every day because they're like fifty bucks a stick. <laughs> it's not an everyday. Look at that torch. I think we've commented on that torch. Yeah. On shows before, it looks like it's from a science fiction movie. Where'd you get that torch, Jim? From SpaceX. Mm. Now, I'm sure that's not something you can just go buy from SpaceX, right? I think they're on their website now. Oh, really? And what, what did that set you back, if you don't mind me asking? Um, this was a gift. So oh, okay. SpaceX lighter. I did, um, you know, I don't have it with me and I, I almost want to reserve it for um, a, an additional segment that's been kicking around in my mind because one of the things I've been really getting into on the um, computer electronics hacking side is ordering weird stuff in electronics from AliExpress. <laughs> and I've really become like uh, an AliExpress enthusiast because I think it's so much fun, just the random stuff that will pop up on AliExpress at a very, very low price and you can order it. And then you have to wait it like a random amount of time, usually like not as fast as Amazon. Let's just put it that way. Um, right. Some of the AliExpress stuff, I think they do warehouse in the U S and I think you can sort the site on, wait, remember, on that stuff. Um, right. You bought that phone. And of course, last weekend I was telling mm. a couple of friends about that phone and we all decided to go and order a whole bunch of crap mm -hmm. from Alibaba. So I ordered a phone. I think it's the same phone as yours. I <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm having trouble. So I I do like to buy uh, Android phones because I was doing some and still am doing some uh, Android research. Um, and when I found this tiny little phone, I mean, the phone is like two, three inches by four inches or something like that, right? And it's purple. Um, and 
it's funny. Every time I describe to our hacker friends that I bought this phone for $37 and it runs Android, everyone's like, oh, send me the link. And so like now a bunch of our collective <laughs> friends have bought this phone and they keep coming back to me and they're like, have you analyzed the phone? Like what they're, they're waiting for me to analyze the phone to make sure it doesn't have malware before we move forward. So I have this pressure on me right now and it's, it's next on my project list uh, in terms of electronics to uh, look at this phone. Um, so phones are one thing, but then I, so what happened was my oldest son, um, Brayden, he is a hands-on welder, woodworker, uh, likes to work on uh, small engines, landscaping, that kind of uh, person. It's amazing. It's like me without the computer aspect to it. And he hacks all of the like mechanical stuff and does welding. Um, and so he, all of a sudden I noticed my cigar torches started going missing and I'd find them in the garage <laughs> covered in like shards of metal and sawdust and everything. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, well, you know, sometimes like I need to heat stuff up. I'm like, I get that. Like if it's stuck, heating it up is, is a thing. I'm like, but can you not take my really nice cigar lighters when you do that? Like I'll buy you lighters or allocate lighters for you to do that. I'm like, as long as you don't set the house on fire, like that was number one safety first in this case, certainly with a teenager working in your garage. I'm like safety first, like, please don't set anything on fire and I will provide you with lighters. So then when I was on AliExpress, I was like, oh, I should order like a, a cheap lighter. And then, you know, on AliExpress, once you start searching for something, it starts showing you more of that thing. So I ordered a torch, which I don't have with me, um, that I'll, I'll bring for the next show. And I ordered a torch and it came in and it was $7.57, <laughs> I want to say, right, from AliExpress. <laughs> and it's this massive torch lighter. And I got in, I started uh, using it, and I was like, Brandon, this is too nice for you to go in the garage. Like, here, you can have some of my other ones. I'm keeping this one for me. And I actually keep it on my desk. And it was like somewhere between 7 and $13 uh, for this really awesome torch lighter. So uh, on the next show, I will make a note and I'll bring it and uh, provide the links to that and perhaps some other stuff on AliExpress as cigar smokers uh, that you can use to go find stuff. I mean, they've you know, all the cigar accoutrements or on AliExpress, but yeah. what I will say as a caveat is it, it's kind of like gambling. Like you don't know what you're gonna get when you order from AliExpress. So this one, I just happened to get lucky. And when you find that, I like to share that with you know our audience to go, I ordered this specific thing and it came in and it actually works and it's good. Cause that's not always the case. I had this idea, you know, I run VetCon every year during DEF CON. Mm. Um, it's a one day party on a Saturday. We get about 4,000 people show up and we we hand out free shirts, challenge coins, and then we sell badges. And this I this year I had this idea of why don't I order like three hundred of those mini phones as the badges? Mm. I like that idea a lot, actually. And let everyone go to town and trying to reverse engineer them. Yeah, what I found with that mini phone is I couldn't figure out a good way to root it. No one had kind of published um, a way to root that particular phone. Uh -huh. So I bought a different one. It was a little more expensive. It was a Xiaomi Redmine 7. I can send you the link, Jim. And that one is rootable. And so I haven't uh -huh. rooted that one. So like one of my coworkers is like, oh, I bought that one too. And they're like, all right, Paul, now I need you to do, do stuff with it and tell me about it. <laughs> like all this pressure, all this pressure. Uh, it's yeah. great. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, I was kind of I was actually pleasantly surprised with um, the amount of torch lighters and cigar stuff that's available yeah, on AliExpress. I, I actually bought this leather case that mm -hmm. I saw in stores for like thirty bucks mm -hmm. on AliExpress. It's, it was six bucks. Yeah, <clears throat> and it's the, and it's the same one, right? And I think they're saving money because it's shipping directly from China, right? And what our good friend Larry told me was that what happens most often, uh, and I truly believe this to be the case, is factory that makes a, uh, a product, they have different shifts. And so the first shift will end and the second shift will come in and the second shift will, will go, we want to make stuff to put in AliExpress. And it's just not going to go through a lot of the testing that the first shift is putting in because the first shift is making stuff that gets get shipped uh, into your consumer electronics or consumer goods. 
And so that's why. And then I think the third shift is like Alibaba. Alibaba is where you order stuff more like AliExpress, but more in bulk. And that's kind of like more the third shift. <laughs> Maybe they do less testing. I don't know. That's how it was described to me. Because I think people I, I, might be wondering like, hey, why can I buy the same product from AliExpress right. for like a significant discount? Like what's the catch? What's the, how does that, how does that work? I met this guy uh, last year when I was looking at a, at a new set of golf clubs and I bought a, a set of pings, not really expensive. And my neighbor, who is an import export guy, uh, I went golfing with him and he said, you know, my uncle owns the factory that makes those clubs for ping. I go, oh, that's awesome. Can you get a discount? He goes, no, no, it doesn't work like that. But my other uncle also owns a factory and they make knockoff versions of the pings mm -hmm. that the first uncle makes. Right. It's like, what? He goes, yeah, I can get you a great deal. It won't say ping, but it's identical. <laughs> nice. I don't, you know, that may happen rarely in cigars, but most of the time, knockoffs are not the same tobacco. It's not the same thing. And we see a right. lot of knockoff Cubans, right? In the, a lot of the Facebook cigar groups I'm in, it's like a running joke about, oh, are these real, posting a picture, like, are these real Cubans? And most of the time they're knockoffs. And those, in that sense, those knockoffs are not the same manufacturing materials. The tobacco is completely different. And they're basically counterfeiting the packaging and the bands and the boxes uh, that go along with it. I, and it I is not heard, the same cigar. I just heard recently that um, there's a cigar company in Cuba that makes a particular brand of Cuban cigars. They are also making their own knockoffs. So they're not using the the, the actual tobacco that's supposed to go into their brand cigar they're using cheaper mm -hmm. but but rolling it with the same people putting the same labels on it and then exporting it as if it was the real thing and that allegedly increases their margins right mm -hmm. i'm okay with that as long as it's got a moniker or delineation that this is not the same tobacco right um like steve saka does this with um the Mikarita in the Umbagog. And like years ago, we had the conversation. And Steve's a great guy and he's very, you know, upfront about it. He's like, look, Mikarita gets the premium tobacco. The Umbagog is a bundle cigar. He's like, I like to take these fishing. And he's like, it's pretty close in the blend, but it's not it's not exactly the same thing. And when I smoke, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, he's right. That's pretty close. Um, and so I'm okay with it as long as when cigar manufacturers do stuff like that, right? Um, Factory seconds are a, a different and I'm not sure factory seconds I think are just completely different cigars a lot of times. Would you call that a, a second or or a real fake? <laughs> yeah, like seconds are supposed to be the like damaged cigars or um ones that maybe have uh like a nick or a sunspot on them. Like that to me is a true second. Like right. it didn't pass the quality checks to be the actual cigar that they're marketing. But I think what happened with seconds is a lot of the online retailers were selling seconds and needed more of a supply. So they just started making cigars, calling them seconds. But the blend, as far as I know, and this is just me speculating, the blend is completely different, right? And they're just calling them factory right. seconds. But it's really completely different tobacco. Because to me, a second should be the exact same tobacco, but... Again, with like a sunspot or it's too lumpy or like there's quality right. standards for all the different manufacturers. So the same tobacco. And so those kind of seconds I like. I'm like, I don't, I don't care if there's a sunspot, right? But like if you're going to pay $30 for a premium cigar, it's got to make sunspot on it. You know, consumers may go, oh, I want a discount on that or whatever. Me, I'm like, I don't, sunspot doesn't affect the cigar at all. Have you ever visited um, a cigar factory? I have not done any of the tours. I know I should have, like, spending this much time in cigars, I should be, the, the answer should be yes, um, but I just, I have not visited yet. I've been I, to I'm, a small I, one. I think we we need to, Stogie mm. Geeks needs to do a trip to at least one or two. Mm. I, I would find it fascinating. Like, oh, I'm, yeah. still, I'm still kind of weirded out of of the water they use to seal the 
the leaves. Mm. Yeah. And, the, you know, you, you look on YouTube and you can watch them do it. That water looks kind of murky. Mucky. Well, mm. it is, actually. It's fu- it's kind of funny. On Stogie Geeks, a couple years back, we interviewed someone called Richard Carlton Hacker. Uh, he actually wrote a book called Cigar Hacking, and it has nothing to do with Paul and your Co- computer, type of, yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with 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 computer hacking, and, and and it was amazing because when he he was talking about the year 1989, there's a whole chapter on it, and we spent qu- uh, uh, quite a bit of time on the the actual interview, and um, Carlito Fluente was uh, walking through the fields in 1989 and like kind of had his hand in his head the way he was describing it. He's like, oh, look at these fields. They're very flooded. We don't know what we're supposed to do because this is going to be a new position for us, et cetera, et cetera. It, it was how they made Opus X. So Opus X is actually have a little bit more flooding and they add more water to whatever type of growing that they actually do to actually keep that brand. So Ooh. that was kind of interesting. Also to catch up on com- uh, conversation, Ping's a great golf club. Has a, a, a <laughs> has a better sweet spot yes. for you, Jim. So if your swing is not quite identical, Ping's are the most forgiving um, cigar club, golf club. Uh, I need I need to take up golf. One, like one could have, so. And here's keep like, swinging with the pings and and you'll have a great score. We need to do a Stogie's golf outing because I recently yeah. I, I bought a, a visor, and that's why I want to go golfing. Is it a golf <laughs> visor? It is, well, it's a visor. <laughs> okay. it's, so I I I like this podcast um, by these two guys out of Canada called Hacked. I don't know if you guys ever listened to the Hacked podcast, um, but if if you haven't, definitely go check it out because I lo- I love their podcast, and so I like to support the podcast that. Uh, I listen to and they have a merch shop and they were on the show and they were talking about how they have a visor that says hacked and I'm like I gotta have one of those because that's just like really cool like even if you don't know what the about the podcast like just having something that says hacked on it I think is cool and so I got the visor and my wife and my middle son were like D- you're not gonna wear that out with us are you <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like I was I'm really excited about this visor like I've been waiting patiently for it to come in and it came in yesterday, and I, I wore it like since the moment it arrived until bedtime. I was oh, wearing God. the visor, and I almost wore it to bed. That's how much I love the visor. And they're like, "You look ridiculous!" Blah blah blah. I'm like, "I'm I'm wearing it." And they're like, "You're not gonna wear it with us." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." Like, tomorrow we're going to a soccer game and spending <laughs> a ridiculous amount of time at Gillette Stadium uh, for a. Uh, it's like their uh, Superliga soccer league is having a thing where they all get to play in the field. And then there's a New England Revolution game. I'm like, I'm going to wear it all day. And they're like, please don't. No. And then I was thinking I need to play golf. Because I like whiskey and cigars, and that goes along with golf. Right. I I view golf as a a great way to smoke new cigars. Hmm. Why new cigars when you golf? Hmm. Because (laughs) I made it a goal that every time I go... um, play golf it has i have to take there's four of us cigars that none of us have or rarely have had Mm -hmm. to try before Hmm. it's a you know great conversation thing yeah along with you know the the spirits we brought and our lack of skills it sounds like I need to go golfing with you and, and your buddies because I'm right there with you. I appreciate the whiskey and cigars first and foremost. And golfing-wise, I, I mean, I can hit the ball for tea. It, right. It'll go somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe not close to the hole, but it'll go somewhere. Right? <laughs> you know, they always say that the um, when you go on vacation, the, vac- the, the destination really isn't what you're after. It's mm. that... It's the travel time. It's being with people. It's going through that that airport at two o'clock in the morning. That's where you're going right. to get most of the stories. Your stories from right. It's oh, the I experience. Right the whole experience. Paris. Yeah, um, and it's the same way with golf. For me, at least, you know, I'm not an expert golfer. I I'll, I, I can hit the ball pretty well. I I have a good, a decent short game, but the fun is all the antics that happen in, in between. Yes. 
Speaking of visiting places, I we I also want to do a trip to Tampa, and because uh, I went there mm. with my family, and I didn't have time to spend at the cigar shops in uh, Ybor City, uh, we drove past it. Um, but Tampa's a great it's a great city. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a pretty easy flight for for us. For Jim, it'd be a little more of a flight, but uh, yeah. it's a great destination. It's all in the U.S., right? Like you don't you don't have to travel internationally. Um, the airport transportation all the people are just great in tampa it's great weather um and there's, there's a lot of things to do i mean we went on fishing trips and all kinds of stuff it was a lot of fun and great fish too like big wow. oh but like fresh <laughs> fish like w whenever we went to a restaurant i w i would make it a point to at least order one of my dishes appetizer or, or main entree in some kind of fish and it was all fabulous right because they're in i mean the bay is is massive and there's all the fresh fish is just plentiful uh so every restaurant we went to didn't matter you know how upscale or or not it was it was just delicious so i have a question mm -hmm. what are your top five cigar lounges that you have been to mm. Mm, that's a great question are we talking about from a stick perspective or from a fun perspective? Because I'll tell you, going to Casa Fluente with Paul in Vegas is pretty fun. I think that's I think that's number one. <laughs> yeah, think, Casa Fluente yeah. in Vegas is, yeah. is and which, it's not so much the because uh, like Casa Fluente it's, itself is in the middle of a mall. You've been there, obviously, right, yeah. Jim? Right, yeah. like it's in the middle of the Caesar Forum shops, right? And it's super small. And but the atmosphere they create in there is amazing. But it's it's kind of it's weird because it's kind of small. The layout's kind of weird. Um, you know, you're like right next to an escalator, like that stuff's kind of weird. But like other than that, it is hands down mm -hmm. the best lounge uh, that I've been to because the people that work there are amazing. The drinks are amazing. They make the best hands down the best mojito mm -hmm. that I've ever had. Um, the cigars are amazing. Every time I go there, they have some kind of you know, rare Fuente stuff that you can buy. Uh, and, you know, and also when we're going there, we're hanging out with all of our hacker friends usually because we're there for a hacker conference. And so we hit, we're in great company, right? Like Jose Blanco always said, the, the worst cigar experience is smoking a cigar next to an asshole. <laughs> and fortunately, you know, our friends in, in, in the, our industry, from a, little, a large part, right? That if you're hanging out, smoking cigars especially, Everyone's great. I mean, that's how I got to know Dave Kennedy um, and uh, you know, someone else who was also a Marine and we were just hanging out smoking cigars. Like, there's so many people. Dave made our good, you know, mutual friend Dave and I spent a lot of time there. So it's interesting how, in your question, Jim, like, what's your favorite lounge? Tends to be the higher up on the list it is, is the, the quality of people and friends that I've hung out with at that lounge. Mm -hmm. And that's what, for me, number one, Casa Fuente. Okay, what's sure. number two? Number two, you know, I have to say the 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 special place in in my heart for the same reasons is, um, I walked into Joyle's Liquor one day, and I saw this sign that said free Wi Fi, and this is back when I was working at Tenable, and I'd always frequented this liquor store, and I had bought cigars in the the cigar shop that they had inside the liquor store. And it said free Wi-Fi. I'm like, Wi-Fi in a liquor store. I'm like, that's kind of weird. And so, like, I I asked one of the people, like, what's what's the deal with the free Wi-Fi? And they're like, oh, we have a whole cigar lounge in the back. And so I brought I was brought back there, and they opened this door to like the left of the cigar counter that I always thought was like employees only or a bathroom or something, right? And they opened this door, and how many seats were in there, Joe? Maybe Probably eight. Maybe eight chairs. Yep. Yep. Eight chairs, one TV, eight like really big comfy chairs. And there was a couple of folks sitting around smoking cigars. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, they got Wi-Fi. I can smoke cigars. Big they comfy TV, chair. Big comfy chair. They no one can find me because I'm in the middle of a liquor store. Yeah. Cool yeah. people hanging around. I'm like, I will be back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at certain points in time in Tenable where I would edit a podcast, for example, I'd go to the lounge, have a cigar, got friendly with all the people there. Um, and it was like the smallest little room with these chairs but the best cigar lounge experience for the cigars, the people. And now, and you're in a liquor store, and so um, it was Paul was the cigar store owner, and Dennis was the liquor store owner, and they were brothers. 
Um, and so Dennis would come in. Now, Dennis didn't smoke cigars, but he would, did the liquor side. So he would come in and he'd be like, you guys want to try some wine or some port or some whiskey or some beer? Yeah. Like, you know, because the distributors would come in and they're trying to sell them on it. And he's like, why don't you guys drink it and let me know what you think? Like, you can be part of our tasting. And so more That's often awesome. than not, it was just like free booze, like little samples of whiskey and stuff. And all we'd have to do is just tell them what we thought. Same thing with cigars. People would come in, you know, reps would come and give us cigars. And uh, when you're in a tiny lounge like that, there's there's no escaping it. If the rep is there and talking, they have to address the room because it was so small. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would we would be like, oh, I'll, I'll try that. I'll let you know what we think. I would have to back up Paul on that. I'd put that in my maybe four or five spot, mm. right? First, Casa Fluente, again, it was great. I was working with Security Weekly. Met Paul's hacker friend, super cool things. It's nice closing deals over Casa Fuente with Paul. Uh, it's a good time. Um, but I've been to a couple. There's one that sticks out, uh, Havana Republic Cigars over in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I've done a couple of Stogie Geeks broadcasts over there as well when when we were going. So I would go on vacation and then report back to Stogie Geeks. The rep actually from Maya Salva hooked me up with him, mm. Paul. And like the guy was I mean, like, "Those were good cigars. Do oh, they still oh, make cigars? Yes, they do. But they they, mm. they were, um, you know, I don't uh, think they distribute much here in the Northeast. No, yeah. no, they're very uh, popular uh, in uh, Europe, right? Ac across the pond, yeah, as, yeah, as, yeah. as, as I like okay. to say, right? Um, but yeah, um, super cool. It, it was a family run business. The guy, and it was actually cool because it actually only had again." 1520 seats. It was on Los Alas Boulevard over on Fort Lauderdale at the time. Small place. But what I liked about it is they sold only wine or beer, mm -hmm. but they had like bottles of wine that you could buy on on the, the wall. So it kind of had like wall hangers. And like you could go there and, and, and smoke a cigar, have a bottle of wine. So if you're with somebody, if you buy a bottle, it's only two 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 glasses you know what i mean so it's, oh, it's like smaller bottles of wine? no 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 a, a, a regular bottle of wine is only four glasses well it oh, should okay. be six but you know, no, no, it's yeah, no one drinks wine like that that's like <laughs> you know because you're not i don't want a shot i don't want a shot of wine i want a glass of fill wine. it up after a crest the, the yeah, cup. Right. Another episode, yeah right but 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 that was a super cool place family owned well welcome talked about sticks and selling stuff like that i got to do a uh uh two stogie geeks live from there so that was kind of fun uh another place in uh uh boynton beach uh florida was uh smoking mm -hmm. so it's it's b-o-y-n-t-o-n -N beach so if i mispronounce it i apologize but uh i think that's boynton and uh yeah that was a fun place when i was on the radio I actually did a radio broadcast the day before I did Story Geese because there was a time where I was I was doing both. And so I walked in and I was like, yeah, you know, uh, can I commandeer this corner? I'm going to broadcast a radio show back in Providence, Rhode Island I'm about cigars. And uh, they're like, yeah, knock yourself out, dude. Like, you know what I mean? Wow. And, so, and so that was because, yeah, again, I think a lot of that has to deal with like what Paul was saying, even at the uh, Casa Fuente. It's the staff. The staff's yeah, welcoming. Staff makes it great conversations. Great people. Staff really make the um, the experience that you have. And <sighs> there's been some lackluster in that industry in in this post COVID era. Not only in the cigar industry, right. but across the whole restaurant oh, entertainment. Um, industry. I apologize. I don't yet have the music and the commercials all done up for the show uh, just yet. So in uh, two weeks, we'll do another broadcast. And uh, I will I will do that. I just didn't program them in my my mixer to have the the music and some of the commercial things. But um, Havana Cigar Club uh, it's also a sponsor. They're right next door uh, to the studio here. Um, and you know I met Todd when I walked in. I was like member number nine or ten or something like that, uh, and bought a locker. And they've been great supporters of the show and supporters uh, of us in general. And I've become good friends with you know all the people there. Uh, and it, it's a great place to have a drink and a cigar, um, as well as um, Mr. J's in my hometown of Coventry, Rhode Island. Um, you know, Paul. So they sold the liquor store and Paul went on to create a cigar lounge. And, you know, what's interesting is you talk about RSA, uh, I think, before we, we uh, started, Jim. And I was at RSA in 2020. So this was right before like the pen. We, we knew 
that there was this new coronavirus, what we called it, like running around back then. Um, but yet we all still went to RSA because the world hadn't shut down yet. Mm -hmm. And Paul called me. He's like, hey, dude, I'm doing a soft opening. And I'm like, I, I'll be in an airplane, dude. Like, I'd love to be like, I would be there in a heartbeat. I'm like, but I'm all the way across the country, man. Like, sorry. I uh, wish I could make it. I wish you the best. And then he started his business in the beginning of the pandemic. Mm. And that's, you know, for a cigar lounge, man, that's super hard for a lot of businesses. But cigar lounge falls in that category of like, it was super hard in the beginning and he was just launching. Um, but, you know, we look at his shop today, the foot traffic into that humidor is amazing. The bar is amazing. The people that work there are amazing. Um, great selection of whiskey. One of the best selections of cigars, uh, probably in all of the Northeast, uh, is in you know Mr. J's Humidor. So that one's those two are certainly on my list where I I have lockers and, and frequent uh, both of them as often as I can. What about I, you, Jim? You've got some I, lounges that you you have a. I went a, to a, RSA twenty twenty as well. Yeah, and um, I remember it. Because I met this guy at the Exabeam booth. Mm -hmm. And when I flew home, um, I got word that he got sick, really sick. And he wound up being uh, in an induced coma and on a ventilator for something like six months because Whoa. of COVID. And COVID they was truly nasty thought he was going to die. Um, I won't mention his name uh, on the podcast. You, you can easily find out who it was. There was a GoFundMe for him, mm -hmm. him and one other Exabeam employee. Um, both both got COVID. Both got it really, really bad. Yeah, in the early days, it was bad. Yeah. Um, Thankfully, now it's not a big deal. He truly is lucky to be alive. I mean, yeah. Uh, on the on the breathing machine, on the ventilator, yeah. and in an induced coma. That's bad. Yeah. A lot of people um, didn't make it out of that state when the rest right. went on the ventilator back then, right? Right. Um, but yes, I, I, I haven't been to hundreds of places, but of course, I'm going to plug here a little bit. Um, the first one is my lounge that I mm -hmm. co-own called La Biblioteca in Placentia, California. Oh, uh, I didn't know you. I think now you did say that before. You do co-own uh, a yeah. cigar lounge. Um. I'm not the majority. I'm like the, the silent investor. That's okay. a good way of putting it. Sure. But I, I like it because um, it's wide open, has great ventilation. I mean, she, yes. uh, Anna, that's, who, a, that's a key. It's a must. It, she, she went all in. That was like 80% of her budget was to build out that ventilation system. Oh, yeah. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars mm, for ventilation right. systems. Yeah. <clears throat> and you walk in and you see everyone smoking. You know, there's 30 people smoking. You don't see any smoke in the in the room. Yeah. You don't smell the cigars even. It, well, it's it's interesting. We, we talked about COVID, right? What COVID was recommending was you replace the air every five minutes for proper uh -huh. ventilation. Most cigar lounges, those systems that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars do exactly that. Correct. They replace the air every five minutes and that's why when you walk in there's no smoke because the system is constantly pumping in fresh air and venting out smoky air. right and hopefully the, where it pumps out isn't where it's sucking in and yeah so you got to separate them right yeah the, the <laughs> exhaust and the intake can't be near each other right yeah yes. yeah. yeah and then and then we just added um um a beer and wine license mm -hmm. so we can make um we can still make cocktails, just not with foolproof alcohol. So it's mm -hmm. like sake-based flavoring wine. We can make mojitos, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. It's, it's kind of interesting. But You can make mojitos with rum without a liquor proper liquor license, or do you make them with something different? So it is <sighs> a company that came up with this. It's, um, it's a rum, but it, the majority of the spirit in the bottle is is a distilled sake. Mm, okay. Okay. So you keep the alcohol percentage less than 27%. And that's still okay. Okay. So it's that's still considered a, a wine. Considered a beer wine license. Beer wine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, well, that's really cool. Right. It's it's really kind of a cool thing. And now, can you, I, I think this is where the different 
laws in different states um, come into play. Because one of my questions when I first started uh, joining the lounges was, hey, I've got this uh, you know, humidor where I can keep cigars. Like, can I bring in a bottle of whiskey? Right, because I'm paying to be a member, right? And yes, I'm still going to order drinks, but like it'd be kind of cool as a member that I frequent to have a bottle of my spirits to share with friends. In Rhode Island, that's a no-go. No-go laws in Rhode Island. But so we I have think a, in California, you can, right? You have a separate club room. You have to be a member. Yep. The general okay. public cannot be around. You're not serving any. Uh, you're not serving guests. Mm-hmm. Um, this is you personally. You have a little locker, and you know you you can put whatever you want in there, and you consume uh, said items within this room. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Even even with that in Rhode Island, that's still a no go. Mm. And the lounges would be open to it. They're like, look, we're just complying with the laws. So like, we'd love to have you, you know, be able to bring that stuff in because you'd go there and you'd still, you know, buy cigars and bring new people in and right. whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, the next one on my list would be Shelly's in D.C. Oh, I love Shelly. Yeah. I, did I bring you there for the first time? Yes. In Shmukon? And And I've been back three times. And you know, equally as good, equally, equally as, great. as good, yes. equally okay. as fun. Uh, the service is impeccable. You know, it, it, it's that strange feeling you're in a big, huge table, and there's 15 of you around that table, and there's three waiters who don't leave. They like stand there. Uh, right. What else you want? You want another cigar? Let me go get it for you. Uh, mm-hmm. You want this? Let me get it for you. I mean, it's super attentive. I, um, that is in my top five. Jim is Shelly's in DC. Um, The fact that you can eat, drink and smoke in the same establishment. Right. And it's accessible. I think it's never like it's big enough space where it's never super crowded when I've, I've frequented there and everything is amazing. Like the food is great there too. It's not. Right. It's the not chicken like. Oh yeah, we're gonna go to there. The chicken wings were the best. It's like, like I never my had. My steak awesome. was awesome. That time yeah. we went, my steak was amazing. <laughs> I stayed one close to there. Uh, old Virginia Tobacco in Old Alexandria, mm. Virginia. That was fun. That was a fun. I'd probably put that maybe three or four. I don't know. I miscount. Have but... you been to us with to Shelley's though? No, I don't no. Think you I have. never. Been, I never been to Smukon. That's a. It's a destination. If you're yeah. in DC, you got. I almost don't want to spoil go. it for everyone. But now I'm telling the whole world, but I'm telling you, it's the main. And Jim and Jax, I, one year we went there. What was that? Shmukon twenty three. Yeah. Yeah. Shmukon twenty three, so. and it was so random. I just went up to a bunch of my, you know, old, older hacker because we're older now. <laughs> Mostly older hacker friends. And they're like, yeah, I want to I want to go have cigar. I'm like, you can drink, eat, and smoke in the same place. And they're like, oh, Jim's like, I'm in. <laughs> I'm Casey, in. Dave, Liz, <laughs> everyone's like, yeah, I'm in. Uh, and we all, Dale, and we all just hung out and for hours. It's great. Right. It's great. What are we drinking? Then, this is then, awesome. So th- <laughs> this is my hack. So, Jim, quick side note. I get the, um, the staves. So these are uh, like, um, uh, what are they? What is that cut called? It's like a spiral. Thank you. Spiral. Whoa. A yeah. spiral cut from a barrel. I'm not sure exactly how they cut it, but they'll take a, um, I believe it's a whiskey barrel that's been retired, right? Because you can only use barrels so many, so many times. Uh, and that differs for, for wine and, and whiskey, right? The wineries take them and then it's used by whiskey and there, there's a whole supply chain, if you will. Uh, those of you that don't know, I work in supply chain security, uh, but there's supply chain for barrels, right? And I think when they're finally retired, the companies will take them and do a spiral cut and make a stave. And mm-hmm. so my hack for whiskey is I buy these staves very cheap on Amazon and I bought these decanters very cheap on Amazon that you can see here on camera. Uh, and I take basically like every, like not a, uh, expensive bourbon but like your everyday drinking bourbon mm. my favorite is elijah craig to mm. do this process with the one we're drinking with the red the reason it has the red ribbon is that's different uh that's 1792 i forget which one i don't think it's even the the higher end 1792 it's like the regular 1792 which, by the way the the redesign of the 1792 bottles suck oh, did they redesign the bottle <laughs> the bottle's always been cool did they redesign it they, yeah it's like they were 
They Google didn't have it. a problem it's to solve there. It's a tall bottle. It's like, that's, oh. that's not 1792. 1792 is the short, round right. barrel. Yeah, yes. bottle, rather. Yeah. So uh, what I do is I take um, those kind of bourbons. Elijah Craig is, is definitely my favorite. And I put a stave and I fill the decanter in minimum 24 hours. Like, don't touch it for at least 24 hours. And you can leave it in. I've left some in for like weeks. Totally fine. Uh, and to me, that drinks like a much higher end spirit after at least 24 to 48 hours. And Elijah Craig is, uh, I'm just, I'm addicted. Like, I, I'm like, I don't find myself having to go out and really experiment and find a lot of different bourbons because I can take a relatively inexpensive bourbon, put it through this process. And I'm like, this drinks amazing. What do you think, yeah. Jim, of my, my, my I, bourbon I, I... hack? That's a great idea. I love that. I mean, I go a different direction and I have three different infinity barrels. Each barrel yes. is 10 gallons. That's a, um, dude, 10 gallons is a lot of whiskey. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot of whiskey. It's a lot of whiskey. Because you can't leave it in there for with an infinity barrel. You're uh, taking different types of whiskey. And I'll let you decide, I'll let you tell us what you know what your criteria is for that. But you basically take a lot of different whiskey, and when there's a little bit left in the bottom, you put it in the infinity barrel, and you you let it fill up, and it sits in the barrel, and it all blends together, uh, and then you drink it. And I've I've done some experiments at home with this as well. But now you have certain criteria for what goes in your infinity correct barrels, certain proof, certain types of whiskey, right? Correct. So the proof has to be a hundred or above. Mm -hmm. So one barrel, I'll just describe the the bourbon barrel. You have different requirements. This is going to software. You have different requirements for each barrel. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and so the one barrel is the bourbon has to be above a hundred proof. Mm -hmm. It has to be high corn. Mm. So mm -hmm. so not so much on the rye side. It, it can have right. rye, but not so much. Um, it has to uh, be from Kentucky or Indiana. Um, and uh, another one is is the pricing level. Um, no, nothing sub fifty dollars. Okay, gotcha. All right. And so I, I have usually, a question. Yep. How do you? Like if you would ask me a question about cigars and say, you know, I want this wrapper, binder, okay, fine. How do you define if you're an average consumer? Like what's got high corn? Well, <laughs> what's got high corn? Like <laughs> uh, that was one of your lot. that was one of your criteria, so I yeah, followed you but, all the way up so, until then. <laughs> but you have to know, right? Yeah, you, you have to know what the mash bill is. You have you have to okay. do a little bit of research and find out what the mash bill is. And huh. um, a lot of Buffalo Trace stuff has higher corn and some rye. Wait, so um, the mash bill is like a, a whiskey S-bomb? Yeah, exactly. Which is, for those exactly. not in software, software bill of materials, right? When you well, get software, talks, there's right? like a list of a list of, a list of of software that makes up that software, libraries <laughs> right. and, and such. And what you're saying, the mash bill is the same thing. It's your ingredients. Correct. Ingredients, yeah, correct. just like you would see in a food label. Yeah. Funny so, thing is, I got that. I was, I'm excited you for myself. You, you got that. Good job, Joe. <laughs> Proudy. So, um, the last run I did for the Infinity Barrel, it took me eight months to fill completely. Mm -hmm. a, a ten gallon. Ten um, gallons, dude. That's a lot of whiskey. That's a lot. Let it sit another four months. Um, so you filled roughly ten gallons of whiskey. You let that sit for ten months. Correct. But I mean, mm. it's being filled over the ten months, oh, okay. and then at the end you. of the ten months, yep. uh, I let it sit another four months. I rotated it a little bit, moved it yep. around, yep, yep, um, and then I bought small glass bottles, um, and then I gave it out to friends. Did and you write down the recipe I as see, you so go you, along? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so so there is a recipe list. Mm -hmm. um, There's an S bomb. The, you need an S bomb for once it hits the <laughs> yeah. glass. Now yeah. you need another S bomb. <laughs> um, or it'd be and, a W bomb is it like a whiskey bill of materials. Can we call it a W bomb? <laughs> and of course there were, there were certain points where I was taking some out just to test it, just to make mm -hmm. sure I wasn't killing it. Right. 
Right, right, right. And so take yeah, along lounge, along the way, you're checking in. Right. Yep. Uh, uh, I would take it to my lounge, and there'd be four or five of us in the back room, and the goal was you're going to take a sip of this, and you're going to write down what you think of it, what mm-hmm. flavors are you getting, what bad things, uh, what good things are, et cetera. Because in another two months, we're going to do the same thing. It's going to be the same juice. It's just aged for two more months. Mm-hmm. And that way I get kind of an idea of, oh, I better stop the process now. Yeah, now it's time to drink it. We do the same right. thing with cigars. I'll buy a box of cigars, I'll smoke one, and be like, that needs to age. Check yeah. back in at, at various times until it reaches the point, exactly what you're, you're talking about, Jim. It reaches the point where I'm like, Okay, we got to smoke all these cigars now because they're not. Right. I don't think they're going to get any better after this point, right? right? Yeah, yeah. That's so, my favorite time. Yeah, that's my favorite the- time, too. and that's a glorious time. Yeah, ten all months. Wait, yeah, <laughs> ten months. I'm already like, God, this takes too long. And I'm like, I, I can't smoke these all by myself. So Joe, Jason, we need to get let's get at it. Speaking of Jason, uh, he pinged us up. Yeah, uh, I quote: "I miss you, mofos. I wish I could be there, brothers." And then he listed a cigar shop that was on his uh, bucket list, uh, El Rojas, which is the mm. uh, one over uh, at J.C. Newman, which I was going to mention as well. Um, it's great. It's a, it's a great tour uh, there as well over at J.C. Newman over in Tampa. And I believe going, us going to Ebor City would be phenomenal mm. as well. With a quick stop in Miami, it's a three-hour drive, but you got to go to the smaller factory that I've been to, the El Titan LeBrons over uh, on Calle Ocho, which is uh-huh. 8th Street in Little Havana. Um, it's pretty cool because when you go to that cigar shop, I always tell people, uh, bring yourself some Ziploc bags and a Shoppie because some of the cigars are not labeled, right? Uh, and you can buy them, and you write down what's on the shelf talker, and it's pretty cool because if those rollers actually make it, they become blends for other cigar companies. So it's it's super cool. Wow. But Jason says hi. So my, you, Jason, my... he was under the weather today and couldn't join us. But Jim, uh, back to you. So like how many you you take it from the infinity barrel and you put it in uh, into glass. You just put that into a decanter or do you actually like bottle it? I bottle it. Okay. Mm. And then and how many bottles? It... I mean, how many bottles is 10 gallons. Well, well, that 10 gallon got full, but really only about eight gallons was drinkable, pourable, Mm -hmm. because there's a lot, you know, filtering stuff out, kind of funky taste at the bottom. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And that wound up making, I don't remember, 200 bottles. Wow. Wow. Can yeah. you ship some? I'll give you an address to your email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that offline. Okay. <laughs> uh, then the second one I started, just started in December, is uh, a rye one. Mm-hmm. And then the third barrel is I bought three cases of port. Hmm. And I filled the barrel with port, and it's still sitting in there. Um, and it's been in there for six months now. And the idea is I'm going to drain it and then put the bourbon that I have now uh, right in the into port. that barrel and see if we can get kind of like a port finish off of it. Hmm. And then I'm sure the port is wonderful to drink as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 10 gallons is a lot of port, though. <laughs> yeah. It is. <laughs> it is. You know, know it's, it's, it, it, it's interesting when. It's a lifetime when, to drink 10 gallons of port because, like, you know, port you pour into the little tiny right. glasses, right? Yeah. Right. I, I And I love drinking port. You know, um, Port is my second go-to after anything whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's great because you can pour a little glass for you and your wife, the wife who doesn't really enjoy whiskey very much, and we'll sit on the patio and we'll just sip that little port. And it, it's very, very enjoyable. What's your favorite kind of port? Oh, man. So a 30-year tawny port. Mm-hmm. Mm. 
Tim Magarini used to talk. He was a host of early days, Stogie Geeks. He would always say the tawny ports. What is a tawny port versus a regular port? You know, I don't know the answer to that specifically, the technical reason. Yeah, we're going to have to bring on like a port expert or something yeah. on the show, right? If anyone knows a port expert, send them our way. We want to talk to that person. Have them on the show. Because port's not something I... I mean, I have it every once in a great while. I don't think I've had it in years. Now I'm going to go to the liquor store. And I'm going to be on the lookout. Jim's fiercely okay, so researching it's basically it. There it comes down to the color. There's ruby ports and tawny. So ruby are ruby red in color. Mm -hmm. And tawny have a brown color. Mm. In in port is wine that's fortified been fermented. Wine. It's it's wine that's gone through what process now? It's fortified. So they, they you know it's, they take the wine and they take some other alcohol. Mm -hmm. They blend those together and then they barrel it. Oh, I see. And what are they, what's the other alcohol they mix it with? Probably just a um, like an Everclear, uh, like grain a just neutral a, spirit. It's like a neutral special. grain grain alcohol, right. I would imagine, right? Yeah, like a right. Everclear, right? Everclear. I used Everclear in my my mm. punches for the summer, but <laughs> back in the day, Ever have you back seen in the day guys? when you were in high school? You might find that. Have Everclear you seen these was guys all the rage, right? And the that they've been buying the, <laughs> they've been buying the the water distillers, you know, you off yeah. of Amazon. Have yep. you seen what they've been I have doing? One. I have a water distiller at, at home. When distilled water was uh, really hard to find because of supply chain issues, I had to feed my humidors. And as a backup, I bought a water distiller and I used it a couple of times. And now it's sitting on a shelf. So these guys are taking like, hey, let's pour Mad Dog 2020 in there and let's mm -hmm. see what kind of uh, alcohol we get out of it. Well, that's interesting. It was pretty nasty. But... <laughs> mm. <laughs> But it's a great little home distillation kit right there. Right. Maybe I'll have to repurpose it now. All right, so back to my list. So oh, first yeah. first was uh, uh, My Place, Shelley's. Um, the next one is King's in L.A. Um, it's kind of a hole-in-the-wall place. You walk in the front door, and, it, and the store is basically maybe 20 feet by 20 feet and you're like this is it oh no no, no. there's a back door a secret back door mm. oh, and secret it back leads door, yeah. to a very high end very nice area i thought it, back doors it, back doors aren't secrets or is that yeah. just in war games <laughs> yeah Hold oh, on, my, we lost my... we lost your video there jim oh wait, yeah, you're back up with that yeah, you're frozen on there there Am I oh, back? now we see your bookshelf what the hell? Your Elgato lost its mind. Yeah, stupid Elgato. I'm running this show on my A Sony A6000 uh, for the double shot on yeah. this show. Um, a lot of very well-known uh, athletes in the LA area like from yeah. the LA, you know, from the basketball teams. Mm -hmm. um, Go Celtics. Also, <laughs> the artists that, that play um, at the Staples Center wind up going there afterwards. It's it's mm -hmm. a pretty exclusive place. Yeah, sure. Um, it's very high-end, as in uh, high-end furniture, uh, tables. It almost like looks like a restaurant in a way in the back. Mm -hmm. um, closed off, big glass enclosed rooms that you could play poker in. Um, but it in that back room, I've met a number of very well known people, and that's where they like to go hang out because it isn't around the general public. Mm. Right, um, it's an exclusive club. Right, and and they're not real big sticklers on. You know, oh, you have to buy a stick from us mm -hmm. because it's all about uh, meeting new people, mm -hmm. having fun. Um, then the next one is this place in Missouri that I just went to 
uh, called, and I have to pull up the picture here, Outlaw Cigar. If you were to Google that, you're going to see they have a giant-ass bar. Uh, is huge... that a, um, what is the conference that's out there? Did you go there for a security conference? No, I went there for uh, two different customers. Mm. Um, and it's funny it because uh, the hotel I was staying at, it was like 9 o'clock at night, and I said, hey, where can I go have a cigar? And he said, well, there's two places. One is Harry's, uh, which I went to the next night. And this place. So I went to this place and I arrived. It's huge. It's it's probably the size of of a Walmart. It's this big. Is Outlaw Cigars in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. Got hmm. it. They have it looks like a Walmart. There. It looks like a giant warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. And I walked in the front door by myself and some guy was standing there. Hey, you're new here. You want a tour? It's like, sure, I'll take a tour. And um, the humidor selection is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty big. Um, the alcohol pricing was perfect. They had a live band in the other room. They have pool mm -hmm. tables in another room. Um, their air circulation system was pretty good. But yeah. they had, at the time, they had well over 200 people in there smoking. Wow. Um, wow. That's a massive lounge. Yeah. Um, then the then there's another one. Harry's is a good place only because they have um, every single Buffalo Trace product you can think of. Pappy, you know, mm -hmm. every, everything. And it is a little overpriced, but not one of those exorbitant, you yeah. know, I'm going to charge you $300 for a quarter ounce pour of Pappy 23. Mm -hmm. It's still $99. Um, and it's a two ounce pour. So in that respect, it's not overly priced. Yeah. I uh, like I like some of those because you can sample and figure out what you like. Is it worth it kind of thing? So if you right. were to seek out a bottle, you know, you know it'd be worth it. Right. Um, still expensive, though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I, uh, Dr. Dog and I ran up a bar tab once at, at with, the yeah, with, with the, the Weller. Weller. Yeah, with the Weller. And all the Wellers. We're trying oh, all no. the different colors. Yeah. I was like, I'm just doing my Bloody Marys. I'm good. You guys are going down a path that's kind of. <laughs> that was you. over $500 yeah. just for the bar tab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, I mean, in, in hindsight, it actually isn't that bad for what that we sampled. It isn't that bad. And then the other. Um, Cigar place. Um, I don't remember the name of it. And it was in Topeka. I was just there and I didn't take a picture of it. And it's one of those old school ones where you walk in and it's a little room with a bunch of big foam chairs, a bunch of guys, you know, in their 60s and 70s hanging out there all day long, a, a single TV. And, you know, I was like, oh, I, can I buy any cigars here? And the guy's like, sure, come on back. And he opens up the door and it's like, did you ever watch that that TV show called Warehouse 13? No. No. No? Okay. Uh, he opens this little door and turns on the light and it was like 300 yards long of Holy all God. these racks of all these different cigars Wow. Um, thousands and thousands of them. And he said, you know, this is a giant humidor. And, you know, you want something from 1975? I have it. Mm. Mm. Road trip. <laughs> yeah. And, and to me, that's what I find interesting about cigar lounges is um, a lot of them are still owned by, you know, the old cranky dude, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they have so much. They have so much knowledge. They have... Uh, they've seen it all. Um, they know the taste on everything. Um, and they're excited about telling you why you should or should not be smoking this one. Right. That's awesome. Do you remember what you smoked there? What did you end up finding? Yeah, he brought out um, a pre-Cuba cigar mm -hmm. from 1955. Wow. Um, didn't have a wrapper. 
Um, it's been sitting on, he has a few boxes of them, and it's been sitting on his shelf since the 60s. That's amazing. Was it good, though? A lot of times those pre-Cuban ones don't. Actually, do... it was very enjoyable. Mm. I, I wouldn't say it's like my, you know, it's the ultimate or anything. It was very yeah, enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. I, I was half expecting I was going to choke on it. <laughs> right, right. Or it was going to fall to pieces in my hand. If it's been properly stored, it'll smoke. It'll smoke. It smoke good, um, but flavor wise, like it's kind of hit or miss with some of those really old vintage Cubans, right? Because uh, Cigar Aficionado has run a uh, column in their magazine for years where they smoke a lot of vintage uh, Cubans. And it's never like this is the best cigar I ever smoked kind of thing, right? I mean, some get high ratings, but not. You know, it's tough to have a cigar hold up for that long, you know? Yeah. So what are you drinking? I'm on the non-red ribbon. The non-red is Elijah Craig. So I'm curious to see what you think of that. I'm still drinking the 1792. What are you drinking, Jim? I am going the opposite direction. I'm drinking Octomore. Huh. It's... uh, a single malt, um, super heavily peated, mm. uh, 62% ABV, and it's made by Brook Lottage. has a great color to it. You know, you, you get that initial smoke peat flavor, but then it has a definite orange flavor to it. I like how you're enjoying whiskey. Like, what time is it for you, Jim? I, I was just going to say, I like how it's like 10 in the morning. It's like and 10 he's in drinking the morning. Whiskey. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I, I won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a breakfast whiskey. Yes, Ooh. and my breakfast cigar. Right. Well, a breakfast cigar is, oh, I love my first cigar of the day. Mm, that's a favorite time. Special it time. Is. And some people like really get like, oh my God, I can't believe you're smoking a cigar first thing in the morning. And I'm like, my first cigar in the morning is my favorite cigar. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite time just waking up, getting the day started, go down in my workshop and lighten up a cigar. I'm like, oh. yeah, these, these two are my favorite morning cigars. Is that the anniversario for sure? Is that the yep. short one? Correct. Just the short Robusta. Oh, hands down. And then Nicaragua. Yeah, I got to try the Nicaragua in the morning. I haven't tried one of those in the morning in a while. It's a wake me up cigar, but mm. I think the Jim, have you ever had a Davidoff late hour in yes. the early hour? Yeah. <laughs> I tell people, like, the marketing is way off on this cigar. That's the Winston like, Churchill late yeah, hour? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the, the Davidoff late hour, first thing in the morning, is like espresso. Like it, you're like it does have a very like, coffee profile yeah, to it. Yeah, because you're, right. you're like yeah. I'm up, I'm up. It's good, it's great. I think Davidoff was a little off on their marketing with that, but um, yeah, that's a great stick in the. You morning. know, my favorite uh, fuller bodied cigar to smoke in the morning is becoming this um, line from HVC that I've just been enamored with, and I've been ordering uh, Jim from your friends at Small Batch Cigar. Uh, I'll give them a plug there. By no means a sponsor, but um, I do a lot of business with them because I, I like I like their online shop and their. I've never ever had a problem ordering cigars from them ever. Yeah, and they when they ship it to you, the amount the attention to detail in their packaging and uh, shipping process is impeccable, and they've had actually on closeout the HVC Cerro Toro. And it's a fuller bodied cigar, but it's not like nicotine sickness kind of strength. It just has a fuller body, but it's not like high in, in nicotine. And first thing in the morning, oh, I love those cigars. I've just been ordering bundles and boxes of them. If they're out of boxes, I just order five five packs. <laughs> and it's, you know, 25 cigars. <laughs> and I still and they were running them on closeout uh, at a, a really good discount. I think I'm paying between four and five dollars a stick for them. And I just, I love them. I smoke one a day, at least, during the so, week. It's uh, great. Can I, can I tell you a little story? Yeah. So, I've been smoking cigars as like a neophyte 
up until around mm, 2012. And this guy contacted me from Instagram asking, uh, I posted something on Instagram about I'm smoking a cigar and I decided to pair it with this alcohol. He sent me a message saying, hey, I have something better. Can I drop by and give it to you at your office? Sure. Um, like 10 minutes later, he had to be waiting down the street. It, it, like 10 minutes later, uh, this guy named Paul shows up and uh, brought me 30 cigars, wide range of cigars, all mm -hmm. different brands, and says, you got to try all of these. Let me know which one you like, which one you enjoy. And then uh, come over to my house and bring some some of your alcohol and let's sit down and, and get to know each other. I'm like, this is, I've never made a friend like this. This is awesome. Welcome to uh, cigars, man. Right. That's right. One of the awesome. reasons why I love it. Right. Um, and long story short, his name is Paul Patel. Um, on Instagram, he's David off guy. Mm -hmm. Um, he personally has, and hopefully his wife isn't listening to this. Um, Many, many, many thousands. And he's also great friends with Small Batch. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul is able to, through his connections across the U.S., um, a lot of stores will, will over-order certain things. Mm -hmm. And he'll come along and buy the over-ordered. Yeah. And then he I've done that with find... closeout. Yeah, closeouts locally here. Uh, uh huh. I, I I do. If they have a closeout sale, it's exactly that. They're like basically this particular brand in this particular line just isn't selling with our clientele. It doesn't mean it's a bad cigar. It just right. it's not it's not that it, like in the uh, product world, it's not a product market fit for us. And so right. they run them on closeout. You know, I'll come in just like your friend, your other friend, Paul. And yep. I'll swoop them all up, right? So, it, it, especially some of these retailers slash distributors that are told by the manufacturer, oh, to get this one product, you have to get, you yes. know, a thousand of these, a thousand of those, and a yep. thousand of these. And, and they need a way of moving those because their clientele don't buy that. It's a crazy business model. Can you imagine applying that to our business model in cybersecurity? Like, oh, in order to get a pen test for us, like you have to sign on for our incident response program, right? And right. you know this pen testing service, and blah and blah blah blah. In order right. to get like that, it's. I mean, from the business standpoint, that's providing the service or good. It's incredible if you can if you can reach that point where you can demand of your customers basically that kind of minimum buy that's it's awesome from a so, the retailer so right the middle person and, and the consumer may maybe not as beneficial so he would go around and broker these cigars mm -hmm. and the majority of the cigars are davidoff mm -hmm. mm. and that's how he got the name davidoff guy mm. um and he's the one who led me on the cigar journey and uh, I think in the past four years, especially, I've learned quite a lot. Recently, however, Paul had a massive stroke. Mm, that's so, I'm sorry and, to hear that. Um, so he's been secluded at home for a while. Um, almost no contact. His family's allowing no contact from the outside. Uh, kind of frustrating. Um, but because of him, I met so many different people in the cigar industry um, from distributors, retailers, manufacturers. Um, and I was pretty blessed to, to meet this guy. And, and for some reason, he likes me. I mean, literally during COVID, when I wasn't going anywhere, um, I'd get a text message saying, hey, look at your front door. I left mm -hmm. something for you. I open the front door and there's two giant Ziploc bags filled with hundreds of cigars. That's amazing. And, and he'd say, now, when you smoke these, write down 
when you smoke them and what you think of each and every one of them. Yeah, and I've been bad at that lately. I've been bad at even snapping a picture of them. I just been I got out of the habit of mm. keeping a cigar journal, and I think hearing your story, Jim, makes me want to. I got to get back to right. it. Yeah. So I I have a, a, a book. I haven't like you. I haven't kept up with it, but for the first two years, I was really pretty diligent about it. Mm. You know, I would take a photo. Yeah. Um, Us too. I, I mean, the Stogie Geeks website is filled with our photos and brief reviews of a bunch of cigars and it's right. interesting that's what keeps our, the website alive and a lot of traffic to our website because we have this catalog of here's what we thought of this cigar and it's not even a full review it's just like a picture like a quick rating and a couple of sentences like this was good or it's not good right and i think that's what people right. are after like i do the same thing when i order from small batch when they have stuff 50 percent off i'm like well i haven't heard of some of these very particular like i've heard of the brand but maybe I haven't heard of the line. If I heard of the line, I'm not sure that I've smoked that size. And I'll go to reviews and go, is that worth it or not? And eight, like 80% of the time, it's on point. If the review is good, I usually like the cigar. It's about an 80% chance. Yeah. And and through this, I also learned that, you know, before I felt that the InfoSec cybersecurity um I'll loosely call it family, uh, industry people mm -hmm. um, were unique in in how uh, when I say this nicely, how things have changed in the past twenty years, for the better on the most part, of of inclusivity, um, opportunity. Um, availability for those people who want to join cybersecurity and yeah. actually do work in cybersecurity. Um, lots of infighting still occurs to this day. You know, mm -hmm. I think it peaked a couple of years ago for us, but it's the same thing in the cigar world, amazingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these things that are occurring, you know, this guy is suing this guy, this guy says bad things about this other person. Etc. And that was a real eye opener for me. But I think welcoming people into a new field, whether it's cigars or cybersecurity, right, is is certainly a thing that we can we can all do better at. And your your friend Paul has certainly uh, exemplified right. that in cigars, right? Like sometimes right. you just need a friend to talk to that has doesn't need to be the world's foremost expert even, but just has knowledge and the willingness to share that, whatever knowledge they have with that person. Right. And that that's, you know, and I'm blessed in both cigars and security uh, to have that. And then it becomes our responsibility now to pay that forward, right? And that's one reason we do the Stoic Geek Show. It's one reason I do the, the security show, uh, Paul Security Weekly, is because we get to share our knowledge, right? And we're, no one's an expert on every single damn thing but we all have pockets of knowledge and i think the the one thing that you know keeps me going and allows me to keep learning is having that network of people and for me in both cigars and security that i can call upon and go i'm stuck or i need a recommendation or hey i'm looking for this cigar like do you do you have right. that which we need to get jeff on the show jeff man yeah. Our good friend, Jeff, man. Um, I don't know. Did I, I, we need to get him as a regular uh, host on this show. Um, and so it was a great story. So I went to um, B-Sides Charm in Baltimore, uh, which is, as you guys know, is one of my favorite conferences, right? Mostly because I, I go see Jeff, right? That's one of the reasons I go to the conference is because Jeff lives in the Baltimore area and I get to hang out with Jeff and Jeff is on the, you know, the board of directors for the conference. Uh, and I'm like, Jeff, I want to come to the conference. I want to, I want to speak. I'm going to submit the CFP and I want to come hang out for the weekend. And the, all of the people that are involved in besides charm that run the show that attend that live in the local area are just amazing people. Um, Bruce and Hottie Potter, or, you know, like it's one of their events they go to. So I get to see them and many of our mutual friends. And the first night we were there, I my cigars were still in my room, right? And I, I don't remember where we were 
drinking and eating in the hotel lounge. It was the first night of the conference. We'd all just flown in. Um, and then we're going outside to have cigars. And I'm like, Jeff, I, I'm just going to take from your box because you take my cigars all the time. So I, just, <laughs> I don't need permission, right? Jeff doesn't need permission either, right? It's, it's a, a mutual understanding. And I go in Jeff's little travel humidor, and I see this Tatuaje cigar. And now I'm going to blank on exactly which one that it is. And, and next time I, I promise to share, or if you guys talk, I'll, I'll look it up in the meantime. And so I reach in and I pull this little Tatuaje. It's got the black label, but it's not a, it's a Tatuaje black that has the silver border around the band and the inside is black. And Jeff's like, oh, I just, you know, I bought those to like give out to people. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to smoke one. And I smoke, I'm like, dude, that cigar, like the next day, I'm like, dude, that cigar was amazing. And he's like, oh, really? I just bought it to like give out to people. And we get back and I text Jeff and I'm like, dude, what was that? Can you send me a picture of that? Like, what was that? And I spend some time on the internet and I'm like, what is this cigar? And then I find it and it turns out, and it's got some crazy name, um, but they only made 500 boxes. <laughs> Wow. I'm like, dude, <clears throat> I, you can't buy the cigar online. It's sold out everywhere. He's like, well, I, I bought it at my local shop. I'm like, can you go buy me a box? Like, love you, man. Can you go buy me a box? He's like, well, I'm getting ready to go on a plane. I'm going to, you know, Idaho for a conference with our other mutual friend, Lee, uh, Lee Neely. And uh, he's like, if I get back, I'll, if I have time, I'll go to the. So he gets back, he goes to the shop and he texts me and he's like, you still want in a box of those, right? And then I didn't respond immediately. And he was like, well, I bought you a box anyway. And um, so I paid him for the box and uh, <clears throat> he's uh, working on getting that to me. But, you know, that's kind of the camaraderie that goes yeah. with cybersecurity and cigars. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I can't wait. And uh, I'd have to look at our text message thread. I'm going to tell you guys what it is while you guys talk. But it, you really, know, it was a really good <clears throat> cigar. If it, if it was a, t a tatuaje and it had a gold band... Uh, no, not gold, silver. Oh, silver. So it is a black label Britannica's Extra. Oh, okay. Britannica's Extra. I can tell you about it. Uh, so it's five and three eighths by 48, according to Half Wheel. It's a Nicaraguan Puro, a sun grown Criollo Esteli wrapper. Uh, MSRP of $11, boxes of 20 were released in 2020, and there was 500 boxes, a total of 10,000 cigars. They smoked three for their review and gave it a rating of 90. And I wow. agree. Whole, and it, I think it's probably even gotten better uh, with age. Wow. So thank you, Jeff, for <clears throat> feeding my cigar habit. And I, you, Joe sp specifically knows this. I don't usually seek out cigars and, like, go out of my way uh, to find, like, rare stuff. Like, I'm, if it happens, it happens. Um, it's kind of where I'm at now. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Great Maybe cigar. we should start, <clears throat> we should start a, uh, cigar con party during DEF CON. We should, you know, I'm not scheduled to go out to summer camp, but I, I can make it work. I can make a, make a flight out there for some shorter period of time, but I, I could come out. Mm. Yeah. Maybe rent out Casa Fuente for five or six hours. Yeah. I'd be down for that. Huh. I'd be down for that. I get my wife to sign my permission slip and I'm there. That's August, right? It is August, yes. yeah. Great cigar lounges in Vegas, though. What's the one in Caesars? That's a... What is that now? It's like right in Caesars. Yeah. I want to say it's JR's, but it's not J. It's Monte Cristo. It's a Monte Cristo lounge, right? I'm Googling the name of it. Yeah, what is the name of that? Jeff and I spent some time there. I've, I've spent some time there at previous DEF CON. J.C. Newman. It's a J.C. Newman mm -hmm. lounge. Did they Julius call Monte... Caesar Cigars, Diamond Crown Family. Yeah, but do they call it a Monte Cristo? No, they don't call it a Monte Cristo lounge, do they? It's like right in... Years ago, I spent a lot of time at Caesars, right? Because I would yeah, go Monte there for training. Monte Cristo train... Cigar Lounge. Monte Cristo Cigar Lounge. And it's like right in... Back when I went there, it was like right near the casino, right near some restaurants, like right there in the middle of Caesars, not far from the lobby uh, uh, in Caesars, basically. 
Uh, that's a great lounge too. I don't know if that makes my top five, but it's in my top 10, certainly. There's another one. And it's uh, Club 8. Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. In, in Vegas. Um, it is a lot. In, I haven't been to Vegas in a while, in a hot minute, but uh, Davidoff Lounge in Vegas, I've been there at least once. Mm. <laughs> that was a good story. That was good. You bought a hundred and fifty dollar stick. I did. And you're like, Joe, why didn't you stop Whoa. me from buying two? Yeah, that was. The, I was like, that's the story. Are you on a roll, yeah, man. I was on a roll. You do, uh, you, do you. you. Do you? <laughs> there was drinking involved. Yeah, I bought Davidoff Royale Salomon. Yeah. I think I smoked it not that long ago. It's an amazing cigar. Not worth one hundred fifty dollars, but it's an amazing cigar. Have, Have you, you ever had the Davidoff Royale no. Salomon? Yes. Great cigar, right? But is it worth one hundred fifty bucks in your opinion? No. Mm. I mean, yes. No. Maybe. I mean, uh, yeah. kind of. <laughs> I mean, to smoke one, right? Like, it's not something you smoke all the time, right? It, it's sort of like, it's it, it's not sort of, it's like asking, so, Pappy 23, $3,000 a bottle. Is, is it good choice? Is that what it's going for now? Yeah. What was it selling for back in the day? Nowhere close to that, right? Well, before like, Matthew McConaughey brought it up, yeah. it was you know a two hundred dollar bottle. Two hundred dollar bottle, and for two hundred bucks, I'd pay that all day long. Oh yeah, for that bottle. Yeah, three grand, no way. Three grand, I'm filling my humidor that's empty right now with a whole bunch of different cigars, <laughs> mm. and a bottle, a couple of bottles of whiskey to boot. <laughs> oh, so one idea I had was. When I fill the export barrel, when I empty the port, fill it, and then empty it again, was to put um, wooden trays inside that barrel and to buy some cigars and let them sit inside that barrel for a few months. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just disabling my notifications. What? You're going to take a whiskey barrel and you're going to put cigars in it. So the the barrel that is filled with port that it hasn't been mm-hmm. dumped yet, after it gets dumped and I put bourbon into it to let it sit there for a while, mm-hmm. then I dump it out, then put in wood shelves, like three or four wood shelves inside yep. that barrel, and then put cigars in there, seal it back up, and let it age for some amount of time in there. You think it even if it's not in direct contact with it, you think it would absorb the aroma? I, I, that's not, I'm, that's your experiment, right? I would right? like it's to just, test. Yeah. Right? Even if it's that subtle hint. Yeah. I know we were talking about um, Tatuaje Cigars founded by Pete Johnson. Uh, and before Pete created Tatuaje Cigars, he worked in a cigar shop and... You know, Pete being the kind that wanted to experiment with different blends and trying to get different flavors out of cigars and has blended some of the most amazing cigars in the world, he kind of started out with one of his experiments was, what if I take a cigar and I put it in pipe tobacco? Like, you know, your big bag of yeah, yeah. or can or whatever of pipe tobacco. He said, what if I put a cigar in there and, and put it in there? And he would experiment with a lot of uh, cigars, basically fermenting, if you will. I don't know what the right term is it's not really fermenting right but putting it in pipe tobacco because pipe tobacco has that aroma that is very distinct and does not right. dissipate one of my travel uh humidors in fact it's sitting right next to me on the floor to my left um i had some pipe tobacco in years ago and it still has that hint of pipe tobacco to it like the foam inside of the travel pack absorbed the aroma and never went away now, I put cigars in there, both in cellophane, not in cellophane, and I don't notice a difference because it is dissipated. But still to the nose, you can still pick up a hint of pipe tobacco. So right. I'm wondering if it's if it's strong enough inside that barrel, Jim, if it will actually absorb that flavor to transfer. Worth a try. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. I also, going back to the very top of the show, you mentioned uh, – uh, potentially buying some cigars that were part of an estate sale that didn't have wrappers on them or in some different state. And I have like a whole bag of tobacco and cigars that basically like have come apart, right? Like cigars that had come apart in my collection for whatever reason or random bits of tobacco. Like I don't remember exactly how it was uh, collected, 
um, there's like a bunch of cigars in there that need repair and the wrappers have come off and I keep that as my, if I need to repair a cigar, that's where I go to like get wrapper relief. And there's a, a process to do that that I haven't done in some time, right? If you get some distilled water and you kind of wet the tobacco down, you can make it pliable enough to like rewrap cigars, let them rest uh, kind of thing and, and repair them. And I haven't done that. The bag has just been sitting there. And I've got a, a, a few cigars in my one of my humidors at home that have some damaged cigars that I usually skip over. Like if I'm getting ready to start work and I'm selecting my cigars that I may want to smoke during the day, I skip over the ones that have a little bit of damage that have been kicking around in my humidor for 10 plus years and the wrapper's cracked or, or peeling off. And I skip over those and I kind of make a note like I need to repair those. and I never get around to it. It'd be cool to do a show or a live stream where we attempt to repair uh, some of those, but then we'd have to let them sit, right? Cause you're going to, you're wetting the wrapper. Then you got to put it back in the humidor. You got to let it rest for a while before you smoke it. Cause it's too moist uh, to light that up right away. That'd be a cool experiment. Yeah, as well. I never know what to do with a, that cigar that the wrappers peeled in more, in more than one location mm -hmm. along the whole stick. Um, well, it's two things. You can do pectin. Have you looked into pectin? No. So pectin is like the... Glue. It's glue, but it's basically a sugar-based glue. And that's what they mm -hmm. actually use to, to wrap the cigar in the, in the factories, right? So you can buy that or you can make it yourself. You can buy the powder. I've done it before. You buy the powder, you mix it with the right amount of water, and it becomes pectin. Uh, and it becomes like a, almost like a glue or a paste that you can uh -huh. use to either repair your cigar. So if your wrapper is just coming off a little bit, like, you know, the, like the end where it should have been glued and the wrapper is just kind of unraveling, you apply that glue, you put it back on there. I'm really bad at it. So I end up using like too much glue and it, it looks ridiculous. I mean, it's probably still smokable, but it looks ridiculous. But if you get the right amount of glue on there, you can put it back, let it rest and then smoke them. Or... If the wrapper comes like completely off, you can put a new wrapper on. I want to say also that's what Pete Johnson was playing with back in the day. He would actually like remove wrappers from some cigars and put different wrappers on them. So there's people that do like a, I call it cigar alchemy, right? And they kind of yeah. play around with that. It's very much uh, in the style of hacking, hacking yeah. your cigars to get them back together. Because once you collect a certain amount, it's inevitable you're going to have a small percentage that either get so badly damaged or through different humidity changes if you're not managing that precisely end up with you know some kind of damage or wrapper coming off so what you're saying is i have to find a place that will sell me wrappers i have to go or, buy or just, one of the or just table. take the wrapper off a cigar and put it on another one so you get multiple damaged cigars and one the wrapper's like not in that bad a shape you can actually remove it and then put it on the other cigar. Hmm. Ask your local um, cigar shops if they have extra wrapper or damaged cigars or whatever. Like I know at Mr. J's, my friend Mark would do that. He would have like a bag and he was like, oh, I can I can fix that for you. And sometimes you just need to patch it, which is very much analogous to uh, our industry, right? But like, if you just got one spot that's damaged, you can take a wrapper from another cigar, wet it enough to be able to cut it, and then apply a patch to the cigar to right, fix right. the damaged spot. Yeah. So do you guys find um, during the work day uh, the need to stop work for a moment, go outside, have a cigar? No, I, I smoke in my workshop where I work during the day. Oh, you do? Yeah. So when I go to work, I have a separate building that I can, it's very small. Um, it, it's enough for me to have like an office and like a little bit of storage and like a beverage fridge, basically. So and it's like separate. my space. Yeah. It's a, probably similar in size to your, your office, right? Like it's, I don't know, maybe eight by 15 or something like that kind of space. Uh, and that I'll go there and that's where I smoke and work uh, when I'm at home. And it's separate from the house. So no smoke comes in the house and it's heated and cooled, all that stuff. Hmm. And then I have to ventilate it. Like I have to air it out a lot because it's underneath my deck. And if I don't air it out enough, the smoke 
will smell will permeate and you walk up on the deck and you smell stale cigar smoke so i have to you know <laughs> clean it clean it out air it out uh pretty frequently so during the winter i'll smoke in here and i mm -hmm. have an air purifier but you know yeah i have a couple of air purifiers too and the only i was looking at um rabbit air has got a great reputation for smoke eaters uh-huh uh, they're a little pricey, uh, but supposedly they work really well. Uh, and recently I've been toying with them in, in my home office. I'm going to take my, I got like those uh, air purifiers we have in here, the Kawe uh, regular air purifiers, and they only do so much. The Rabbit Air is meant for cigar smokers. Um, and they've been running some sales recently. So I've been looking at upgrading my uh, smoke eater kind of thing. Now that winter is kind of past what i'm doing is um i open a window and i put a fan in the window to vi either vent fresh air in or you know take smoke air out kind of thing because the weather's better but then once like humidity in the middle of the summer hits i gotta i can't open the windows otherwise it gets too humid in the space hmm. but rabbit air is the one i've seen some facebook ads uh for that because facebook targets me because they know me and they're like hey you smoke cigars you should have one of these. So the rabbit air is 600 bucks for the small yeah, one. 600 bucks for the small one. Right. And for our spaces, Jim, probably the smallest one would probably work just fine. Right. Right. You can get a small ozone machine too, which I have one of those too, but you, you can't put, be in the same space with yeah, the ozone. Yeah. So, yes. so you put the ozone machine on, right. you can put it on for like four hours. When are you going to leave the space? And overnight? those are cheap on Amazon. Yeah. I bought one, Joe, to yep. your point, And yep. I will do that in my workshop every once in a while. I will close all the doors and the windows in my workshop. I'll leave the ozone generator on for 24 hours and then I'll go in and I'll turn that off and then I'll open up all the doors and windows and turn on my purifiers mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to get the ozone kind of smell because ozone leaves a very distinct um, odor uh, yeah. to it. You, it, you I mean, it kind of smells almost like fresh air, but it's very it can be very pungent sure. if it absorbs that ozone. So then I'll air it out after that, and that tends to get rid of my the smell. Yep, and yep. sitting next to an ozone is not pleasant. No, don't so, don't breathe yeah. the ozone. It has warnings on it. Like yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. be in there breathing the ozone. Yeah. So like there are a couple of cigar shops that drag out ozone machines and stick them in overnight. Yes. You put them on a 6 to 8 hour timer and then boom, it's all set for the next business yep. day. And you know what I found car you know that's how car dealerships refurbish cars. Mm -hmm. Like if, you sm if someone had a car they smoked in, mm -hmm. what they do is they run an ozone generator in it for 24 hours in the car. And it's completely gone. And the, it wipes out any smell. As long as you don't have any air coming in and it's kind of airtight. Yeah, you got to close it off. Yeah, I know a car's not airtight, but it's it's close, close enough. It's, yeah. it's close enough. So if you have your, your space where there's no windows, close the door behind you, put it on. And it doesn't do anything to electronics? No. No. It does not because I have a lot no. of electronics in my office too, Jim. Yeah, And the same soundproof foam, that foam absorbs the smell. And right. so the ozone kind of helps you get that out of the, the uh, foam. Okay, I just bought one. There you go. I bought a, a mini ozone. Yeah, you, yeah. You, if you put that on and throw it on just for don't six breathe hours yeah. while, while you go to, like, like when you leave your office for, for the night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Throw it on, come back in the next morning. Most of them have like an automatic timer. It's usually yep. a dial yep. switch that kind of like makes that little clicking noise if it's quiet, and then it'll shut off automatically and you'll be all set. There you go. At your best bet. Good advice from the Stoey Geeks on how to do yeah. ventilation. And it actually and arrives today at 2 o'clock. That's awesome. Yeah, there I bought mine on Amazon. Yeah, it's, it's great. I've used it in my cars, too. Yeah. My son had a puking incident. Mm. In, so, so in, you're saying that's what Tesla. Seinfeld needed when he wanted to get rid of his car? <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm telling you, that's exactly what dealerships use. Because I traded in... My, remember my old uh, Toyota Tacoma black truck, Joe? Yeah. How yeah. many times did we take that to Boston and, like... Oh, four, yeah. Oh, yeah. There'd be four of us with cigars, <laughs> you know, an hour and a half or more each way, depending on traffic, uh, back and forth to Boston and do a conference. And the truck would just smell when I traded it in. Uh, the Tasca folks, one yep. of the Tasca folks is uh, Carl, is a good friend of mine. And uh, he's like, no, we got to process for that. He's like, we basically just put an ozone generator in it. I'm like, oh, that's the secret hack. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, 
you'll be very impressed with the ozone. Um, just like I said, when you're done for the night, put it on, leave the room. I, and then I, I'm really curious to try the rabbit air too. Mm-hmm. In terms of, well, the, the rabbit air, I would imagine smoke eater would be pleasant while you're in room. When you're in room, you yeah. run the rabbit air. Yeah, like, because I've just got regular air purifiers that have the carbon uh, filters in them, and then the HEPA filters for for dust. Um, and I've got two of those in my in my workshop now, but I don't I don't think they do as good a job as a rabbit air does in terms of removing smoke. I mean, I think they do um, get rid of the big stuff, but yes. it's that oh, it's cigar in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is that smell? Well, you don't want to be. I mean, health wise, right? And this isn't a health podcast, and I'm certainly not a doctor, right, or a lawyer, but. <laughs> You don't want to be breathing in a lot of secondhand smoke. Like when you smoke, because people are like, oh, you smoke cigars. That's a health risk. I agree. It is a health risk. But as best to our, our ability, we should be trying to remove the ambient smoke from the room so you're not breathing it in all the time. So make sure you're smoking in a well. Outside is best. If you're moving indoors, make sure you've got good you know, ventilation. And again, the secret is fresh air in, smoky air out, or and or a, a smoke eater uh, inside. What I can see our smoke eater, our smoke eater here in the studio. I moved in uh, to this side, has the red uh, LED light symbol that it's the air is not pure because Joe and I are in here smoking cigars, so it's working overtime. So, have you guys ever gone to PCA? I have not. No. 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 Why not? (laughs) There's a lot of political. You want to go first? You want to go first on this one, or you want me to take it? You know, it's interesting, Jim. You asked that question because there's a lot of interesting kind of like political issues, like in the and I've I've talked about this on the show before. um, In the like the cybersecurity realm, it's not unheard of that any one of us would attend as a speaker or a media personality. And the conference is very welcoming to that, right? Now, some conferences have more of a uh, process to identify you as a media personality. And I've had my, you know, back and forth with some of the conferences. But in the end, in cybersecurity, in large part, you can talk about the biggest conferences that we have. RSA, Black Hat, for example. They're like, oh, you want to show up as a media personality? They're like, totally fine. Right, and they're they're welcoming to that. It helps promote their their brand. They'll give you a pass for free. They'll tell you where the spaces are, where you can conduct your your business, and as long as you're not conflicting with the conference, they're totally fine with that. In cigars, it's kind of this weird thing where the media is not treated in the same way. They almost don't in the PCA. They almost don't want media there, and I don't know recently where uh, that has kind of gone, but mm-hmm. uh, they don't treat media in the same way, which I find weird because if any one of the three of us were to spin up a conference, we would welcome media, right? I mean, that's how you grow a conference, get attention. They talk about all the great things happening at the conference. So, and and that's not a knock on PCI. Again, I'm not uh, close to what's happened recently (laughs) with PCA. But have you gone just as an attendee? No, I have not. No, no. Would Can you I be go? interested? <laughs> I'm 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 down for a trip. I mean, Joe and I were talking about Pete. when we we were had some opportunities to go to that show, but it's like a week or two before Black Hat, and yeah. we were scheduled to go to Black Hat, and so right. it's like we got a couple. It's hard for us on the East Coast to go. We're gonna go all the way. We're gonna go to the West Coast, and then we're gonna come back, and then we're gonna go back out. You know, again, uh, it it can be hard to justify that, especially when. In the cybersecurity business, you're planning on doing a lot of activity at a black hat. Uh, it, it can be disruptive, and that that's why we weren't able to attend. We're certainly not opposed, though. When is the PCA? It is. Uh, it's changing. Uh, PCA is scheduled in March now, moving forward. Oh, nice. It'll be in New Orleans, which is oh, closer okay. to us. Yeah. Uh, there. Um, oh, I'm down. Like so in basically, 20, 2025, Jim and Joe, if you guys want to go to PCA... 
uh, in March in New Orleans, I'm there. Let's yeah. let's go. Let's, let's I meet, have hang out for a couple of days. I'm cool. I have had the opportunity since 2017 to attend a PCA, and every year I respectfully declined. You can you can go as a, a retailer can get you a ticket. Yeah, you could. We could register as media and try that route uh, as well. Not opposed to that either, uh, in seeing where that brings us. But we might need a sponsor to you know get out there in, in terms of uh you know tickets i'm not sure how it works but we can we can work those angles and, and try and get out there yeah any type of pca booth if you jim if you are intended uh if you are inclined to go i can certainly get you in uh between paul and i have a bunch of different avenues for sure um i'm strongly considering going this year anyway yeah, I like New Orleans. New Orleans as a venue is great. I love it. You guys both been to New Orleans before? It's a lot of good. Oh, it's, yeah. It's a good time. <laughs> I was in New <laughs> Orleans in the, the early 2000s. And there's, a, at least back then, the two big hotels were right near Bourbon Street. Mm-hmm. Like one was a Marriott, one was a Hyatt. And they're like right on the, I forget what the main road is that goes across Bourbon Street. But they're like they were right there, and I know Katrina and a lot of those things, you know, shifted, and it's been twenty plus years. Uh, but I remember back in the day going to a Sands conference, and my friend and I sitting in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel, right on the corner of the Main Strip and Bourbon Street, and we were drinking whiskey and having cigars right in the lobby of the hotel because smoking was allowed back then. In the lobby of the hotel. Can you imagine going to a lobby of a hotel bar mm. today and smoking a cigar? Security got to be like, those were the here. days, man. Like, mm. those were the days. Yeah. So, New Orleans hey, is a great, great city. How can I share a screen? I think you can click a thing to share a screen. If you click share, I saw that earlier. Click share. Don't click leave because it's right next to leave. It's right next to leave. Yep. On the bottom. On the, the bottom. Bottom, it says share. Or, the, or can only the host share. I like oh. how Jim's doing the old man looking at the screen thing. Dude, I'm in the same boat, dude. I, I'm always looking at electronics, like old man through the bottom of my progressive glasses. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. It's like, yep, yep. Uh, uh, I think it's this one. Don't click leave. Oh. Uh, Do you not have a share? Hell? At the very no, bottom. I, I, now it says I have to restart to share. No, I don't uh, restart. Don't do that. That's garbage. What do you want to tell us? Read uh, off the screen. Read off the screen. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We'll Let's work see. on that for next time. There we go. No. Did that share it? Nope. No. Can I share my screen? Yeah, you can share a presentation on the screen. Yeah. Mine comes up. If I hover over share, it comes up like, do you want to share your screen? Do you want to share a presentation? Not for you, huh? No. It says I have to restart. Not doing it. Oh, mm. well. Oh, well. Well, just describe. What, what were you we going to share? share? Yeah, now we're all like a, on the edge of our seats, Jim. What are you going to share? The Three Kings. Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, oh, is wait, that a cigar? Chat room. I'll, I'll put it in the chat room. Can I do that? You Which one? In the chat. Yeah. You can put it in the Riverside chat. No, it doesn't let you upload images. Oh, oh you can give me a link. Uh, uh, is he on his Slack? Uh, wait. Oh, wait. Here's what I'll do. Here's what I'll do. You can... Over here. Oh, look at that. If I make the chat go away, we're we're more in frame than I thought oh, we were. Look at that. I was like, lean, Joe and I were like trying to lean into each other for the whole show. And then I got rid of the chat and it looks beautiful now. Oh, I feel, mu- I feel much better about the video recording now. Except your face is kind of washed out. I needed to turn that. Mine? Yeah. Oh, I lean forward. Yeah. I need to turn I one of, I, that light right there. I just push forward. No, I turned on the wrong light. It's my fault. All That's right, fine. I sent it to you in Signal. Okay. Signal, all right. I'm on that. 
Oh, dude, that's amazing. No, I'm not on that. What is that? Send it to Paul. Yeah, I don't know if I can get that on the the screen, but it's. What is this? Your is this RSA? No, is that this Wim is Reeves? Uh, and yeah. who's the dude in the middle? That's Bill Kimball. We were okay. chosen as the three kings for uh, Mardi Gras during ISE Squared. Oh yes, because Wim is very involved with uh, ISE yeah. Squared. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Like New Orleans is a great, great city. I haven't been there. I in love a while. New Orleans. There, there's actually a great. There's actually a couple cool uh, cigar slash whiskey bars that a friend of mine who's in the Coast Guard turned me on to because when they had NCIS New Orleans, he would fly there mm -hmm. for the filming, and be he became friends with all the uh, cigar places you can think of. So all I have to do is mention his name, and it's like stuff is free. The whiskey is flowing. The cigars come out. I've not been to – are there good cigar lounges in New Orleans? You know, I don't think I've been to – so they don't define themselves as a cigar lounge, mm. but like this one place, it's it's a a lounge, predominantly all alcohol, but they allow smoking in the back. It's kind of like Frankie's Tiki Room in Vegas. Mm. Yeah, they're a bar, and they're like, I don't care if you smoke cigars as long Correct. as you guys are running up a good bar tab, which we do when Correct. we go there. Yep. Mm. And the guy who owns this place that was fun. Oh, um, dude, owns, so many Frankie stories. Uh, one of the strip clubs in Vegas. Mm. And is sort of, we believe, connected somehow. Sure. Yeah. We he did, was the we attorney to, yeah. for a few um, mob or family members. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a friend of ours. Basically, yes. yeah, a friend yeah. of ours, yeah. It's a great I podcast. With, I, I think uh, it's a great place to hang out. Uh, so many parties and events every night. Yeah, I'm, I'm down for New Orleans, dude. You guys want to want to go? I've been in New Orleans in a long time. Hey, yeah, it's a great it's city. A, it's in March. Um, I know next door is going, so we can get in. We, we should yeah. do a, a Stogie. The Stogie uh, event live from there. Yeah. I've been, uh, as I start to build up the studio, I've been kind of flagging gear for like, if we had to go on the road, what would we do? We need that little red box thing. I've got, no, I've, I've got, yeah. No, dude, I've, <laughs> there's definitely. Here's an idea. We, we all take three months off from work mm. and we rent an RV. Mm-hmm which is the studio, and we pull up at every single uh, B-Sides, oh, every dude, single love conference. That. Oh, that's on my bucket list now. Well, that was like the schmoo bus. Right. Remember Jack Daniel uh, commissioned a bus to like drive everyone to like ShmooCon. It was one conference, but like that's a thing for sure. Yeah. Well, it the one gotcha. defcon uh, or two defcons i rented a, an rv and we started in california and we picked people up along yes, the way that was jack's model for the schmoo bus yeah. Uh, yeah in arizona texas new mexico kentucky tennessee it was it was awesome well you hold on but kentucky and tennessee the, those are all the way on the other coast for DerbyCon. Oh, for DerbyCon. I got you. I thought you went for DefCon. So for DerbyCon, we had, you started in California and you worked yeah, your way we had across over country. over 500 bottles of whiskey in, in the RV. And everyone took turns driving. So mm -hmm. it was like, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Evan, come relieve me. We're still driving. And, you know, you do that mid yeah, hot swap. swap. Hot swap. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Whoever sobered up enough, now you're in. Now you're in. That's <laughs> you're right. You're in. <laughs> it was funny because that was the switch. We switched over, and I went into the co-pilot seat, and like 10 minutes later, we ran over a coyote. Oh, mm. I mean, that happens. <laughs> I mean, it's inevitable. That much driving, you're going to run over something, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. 
Well, awesome. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning into the Stogie Geek Show. Uh, we are back. It's been almost a year since we've done an episode, and we have uh, a new schedule that um, twice a month we're going to be doing this show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in live. Um, it was very much an experiment, right? We had like roughly seven people tuning in live. I didn't do a lot of promotions because I wanted to get everything working, but we successfully streamed live to uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. So thank you to our dedicated listeners. And uh, you'll be seeing this uh, recording come out uh, very soon. And uh, thanks, everyone, for making it happen on Stewie Geeks number 380. Yes. With that, we'll see everyone next time. Thanks for tuning in.